In this episode of Scaling Postgres, we talk about PG failover slots, standby logical decoding, trusted language extensions, and Postgres Package Manager. I'm Creston Jameson, and this is Scaling Postgres, episode 262. All right, I hope you, your friends, family, and coworkers continue to do well. Our first piece of content is PG failover slots. This is from postgresql.org in the news section. And this is a new extension where your logical replication slots can now fail over to a replica, which is awesome because imagine you have a primary server and a replica server and your doing physical streaming replication from the primary to the replica, but then something happens to the primary and you need to fail over to the replica and essentially promote it. Well, if you do that, the logical replication slots that may be existing on the primary don't get carried over to the replica. So you may have to restart logical replication from scratch again. But now with this new extension, it looks like they can fail over. And you can see what the extension does is it copies any missing slots from the primary to a standby remove any slots from the standby that are not found on the primary, so it tries to keep them in sync. And it periodically synchronizes the position of slots on standby based on the primary. And lastly, ensure that the selected standbys receive data before any of the logical slot wall senders can send data to consumers. So this is how these failover slots are trying to keep everything in sync, essentially between two servers, so that if there's a failover event, that promoted replica has its replication slots at the identical position of the former primary. So this is super interesting and definitely going to be checking it out. Although the question I have is, why is this an extension? And will this make it into mainline Postgres at some point? Maybe this is a way to test it out and make sure it's working well, but hopefully this feature will eventually make its way into Postgres as well. But if you want to learn more, definitely check out these pieces of content. Next piece of content, Postgres 16 highlight, logical decoding on standby. This is from bdruvit.github.io. And historically, you cannot do logical replication or logical decoding from a standby. And he shows if you try to create a logical replication slot on the standby, it fails. But with this commit to 16, you can now create it. So he goes through the process of exercising this new feature and how it works. So this definitely gives a lot more options when you're working with logical replication. Maybe you want to stream physical changes to a replica, but then actually logically replicate from that. But if you want to learn more, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, trusted language extensions for Postgres. This is from supabase.com. And we talked a little bit about this in a previous episode of Scaling Postgres where AWS released an extension called PGTLE for trusted language extension. And with this, it means that once this is installed, a Postgres extension written in a trusted language can be installed on the server that has the PGTLE extension installed. And essentially, a trusted language has protections to not access the file system or maybe certain areas in memory. And this is intended for cloud providers of database services to be able to install these extensions without harming the neighbors on shared infrastructure. And it says you can install these extensions from any database client using the function PGTLE install the extension. Now, what's interesting about this is the next post also from Supabase, which is the dbdev PostgreSQL package manager. So for these extensions that are using trusted languages, essentially trusted language extensions, they created a package manager for this at the site, dbdev, and it enables you to easily connect up and use packages from it. And the intent is to essentially be like the NPM for JavaScript or PIP for Python or Cargo for Rust. Now we'll eventually see where this goes, but it's definitely pretty interesting. So once you find a package of interest, you can use this command, select dbdev.install, and then create the extension in the database with a particular version that you want. But if you want to learn more, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, PostgreSQL and SQL 2023. This is from petereisentrout.org. And this is a follow-on from his post talking about the new SQL 2023 standard. And here he compares all those different features to where Postgres is with regard to support of them. So you can see a lot of them have been in place for a while, some of them in more recent versions like 14, 15, and are on track to be in 16, we'll ultimately have to see. 
And then a few more that he thinks are potentially good for the future, and one that probably is not going to be done, a string-based JSON, in his opinion, isn't worth doing. But this is a good comparison to see where Postgres stands in relation to the new 2023 standard. So check this out if you're interested in that. Next piece of content, writing data from Postgres to MongoDB. This is from crunchydata.com. And their use case was that they had a purchase API that kept sending data to a Postgres database, and then periodically it aggregated it into a document, a JSON document presumably, stored it in Mongo for users to be able to retrieve receipts, for example. So with this use case, basically they set up a foreign data wrapper so that Postgres can speak to MongoDB and insert data into it. So they go through the process of setting up the tables in Postgres, showing how to generate the JSON that will be stored in Mongo, creating the foreign table as well as a trigger to keep that updated and syncing existing data. So you can definitely check this blog post to see how that is all laid out. But of course, I'm thinking about why would I want to use Mongo <laughs> when I could probably just store it in a JSONB field and you're already using a trigger, so you could use a trigger to create that JSONB field. Or if you didn't want to use triggers, you could use a materialized view, perhaps, and refresh it on a periodic basis. So I don't know if I would necessarily use MongoDB for this use case, but this shows a way of how the MongoDB foreign data wrapper could be used. Next piece of content, who contributed to PostgreSQL development in 2022? This is from arhas.blogspot.com, and he's listing all the different code statistics for Postgres development. As you can see, this list is by top committers, and you can see Tom is in that top position here. Then he has the list by lines of code. So lines of code that were changed, but they weren't necessarily the principal author of it. And here you can see Alvaro is number one here. And then finally, here are people who sent at least 100 emails to the PGSQL hackers list in 2022. And you can see Tom is again top on this one. But I do find it super interesting to see all the different names here and relate that to presentations I've seen or blog posts that I've read or even Stack Overflow posts. Like frequently I see Tom Lane had a lot of answers in Stack Overflow posts. But definitely check this post out to see who contributed to Postgres. Next piece of content, efficiently delete old rows with partitions. This is from sqlfordevs.com. And he's talking about the use case of using partitions for data you only need to retain for a specific period of time, and then it can be deleted. Well, the easiest way to do that is with partition tables. So in this case here, he's using audits, which is a perfect use case. Generally, after a period of time, you no longer need that audit data. And he's partitioning by year and by month. So when the data has expired, you can easily just detach the partition and then drop the table and all that data is gone. If you weren't using partitions, you'd actually have to delete the rows. Now that can take a long time. And then the worst part is your data file won't really shrink that much. So now you have all this dead space in the file. Now you can reclaim it, as he says here, using vacuum full, but that locks the whole table for writes and reads. So then you'd have to use something like PG repack to essentially rewrite the whole table to reclaim space. So generally, it's easier just to set up partition tables for this type of use case. And he explains how to do it here. Next piece of content, can there be too many partitions? This is from kmopple.github.io. And he did tests of partitions ranging from no partitions to over 4,000 partitions to see how the performance changed. And what's interesting, the plan time only doubled, but really it, that's an insignificant part of most queries. And the mean execution time for the most partitions did drop down a little bit, but again, not significantly different from no partitions. Now, many of his queries were key-based, so maybe different types of queries would have different results. But what's interesting is the performance didn't really change all that much, up to 4,000 partitions. So based upon this data, I would say you could probably have at least 4,000 partitions with no harmful effects. But of course, the question is, what happens when you go to 8,000 or 16,000 or 32,000, which I probably wouldn't do. I usually like to keep it in and around no more than a thousand mark, but it looks like you can go to 4,000 quite easily with recent versions of Postgres. But if you want to learn more, check out this blog post. Next piece of content, waiting for Postgres 16, buffer cache hit ratio and IO times in pgstat.io. 
This is from pganalyze.com, and this is the next episode of 5 Minutes of Postgres with Lucas. And he's discussing the new view, pgstat.io, that's coming in 16. And he says there have been two recent enhancements to it. And one of the things these enhancements does is it allows you to better measure the buffer cache ratio to get a gauge on how soon you would potentially need to upgrade your hardware. But basically, you get a lot more detail with the I.O. of the given system. So definitely check out his episode if you want to learn more about that. Next piece of content, explain generic plan, new in PostgreSQL 16. This is from cybertech-postgresql.com. And he's talking about the new capability in explain where you can actually specify a generic plan and you can give it parameter placeholders such as this to better understand statements that are prepared statements. So it allows you to get a good explain plan. And he discusses a few of the limitations of this as well. So if you're interested in that, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, underscores and numeric constants in PostgreSQL 16. And this is from cybertech-postgresql.com. And this was mentioned in a previous post by someone else on Scaling Postgres, but this goes over that feature again, where instead of writing these really long numerics, now you can put underscores between them to give you separation and make it more easy to read, as well as be more accurate, making sure you're specifying the correct amount. So if you're interested in that, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, PostgreSQL for the SQL Server DBA, the first four settings to check. This is from softwareandbooze.com. And if you're someone who uses Microsoft SQL Server and is moving to Postgres, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, how to set up PGTAP for writing PostgreSQL database unit tests. This is from endpointdev.com. And PGTAP is an extension that allows you to write unit tests in Postgres. So you can test and verify things like, for example, your table exists or your column exists or your function returns an expected result. So check this blog post if you want to learn more about how to set that up and get that working. Next piece of content, Postgres fun with LW locks. This is from pakier.xyz. This is definitely an internals focused post where he talks about the internal functions in Postgres for handling lightweight locks. So if you're interested in getting into the details of Postgres, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, waiting for PostgreSQL 16, add array sample and array shuffle functions. This is from Depeche.com. And he's talking about where you can now sample items from an array, as well as take the item as an array and shuffle them around, which he said could be useful for Monte Carlo applications. Next piece of content, accuracy of geometry data in PostGIS. This is from blog.rustprooflabs.com. And they're talking about geometric accuracy and how latitude has a significant effect on it. And the further you get away from the equator, the more error that can be introduced into your calculations and how to actually deal with that. So if you're interested in learning more, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, using encryption at rest for PostgreSQL in Kubernetes. This is from Procona.com. And specifically, they're talking about using their Procona operator to be able to set up Postgres on Kubernetes, handling a encryption at rest requirement. So if that's of interest to you, you can check out this blog post. Next piece of content, there was another episode of Postgres FM last week. This one was read-only considerations. So basically, these are use cases where databases are predominantly used in a read-only state, and maybe they're refreshed once a night. So if you're interested in that type of discussion, you can check out the audio or the YouTube here as well. Next piece of content, the PostgreSQL person of the week is David Christensen. If you're interested in learning more about David and his contributions to Postgres, definitely check out this blog post. And the last piece of content, we did have another episode of the Rubber Duck Dev Show this past Thursday afternoon. This one, we discussed leaving the cloud. And this is a reflection on something that David Hannemeyer Hansen and his company 37 Signals is doing in terms of leaving one of the major cloud providers and co-locating their own servers and setting up their own infrastructure away from one of the main cloud providers. So if you're interested in that type of discussion, we welcome you to check out our show. That does it for this episode of Scaling Postgres. You can get links to all the content mentioned in the show notes. Be sure to head over to scalingpostgres.com where you can sign up to receive weekly notifications of each episode, or you can subscribe via YouTube or iTunes. Thanks.